Dobrý den znovu, vážené dámy, vážení pánové. Good afternoon. One more time, ladies and gentlemen. We have closed the section entitled Cycro Monuments and Authoritarian Regimes. And what is ahead of us is the closing lecture and the end of the whole conference. So let me welcome Richard Pico. I will introduce him shortly. He is an art historian and he is the director of the Department for Art History at the Faculty of Arts of Charles University. At the same time, he is the vice president of the club for the Old Prague. And he is also active in the field of preservation of material heritage. He also gives lectures in the Department of Art History at the University. And his today's closing lecture will be an evaluation of the 50 years history of Prague Heritage Reserve which is also the topic of his dissertation. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words of introduction. And also let me thank you for this fantastic conference because all the lectures were very interesting. I will share my presentation. Can you see it? Great. So today, Prague is clearly perceived as a monumental metropolis of global significance, which is reflected not only in its inclusion on the World Heritage List, but also in the continuing interest of visitors and lovers of monuments from all over the world. From today's perspective, it may therefore be interesting to note that the official area-wide heritage protection of this extraordinary historic, historic complex has had a rather complicated history, which has moreover resulted in the, in the measures taken relatively recently. In fact, the heritage reserve was only declared for all the main historical units in the capital in 1971, almost 20 years after the establishment of the first urban reserves in the Czech lands. I believe that our joint meeting is an ideal opportunity to commemorate this half-century anniversary. In my opinion, the story of the efforts to achieve comprehensive monument protection in a major European historical metropolis such as Prague offers insight into a number of principles and themes that go beyond the narrow regional framework of Czech lands. This year, the Prague Heritage Reserve celebrates 50 years of its existence. Its declaration in 1971 meant that not only the whole area of the originally Gothic new town with Vyšehra, but also the important sight lines of Letna and Smicho Bank were added to Hradčany, lesser town of Prague and the old town, which had which has been protected as valuable historic, historical units since the early 1915s. Thus, the whole of Prague's historic corn abation was placed under area conservation protection. This protected not only those parts of the city that escaped significant 19th and 20th century reconstructions, but also those that exemplify them, such as the area of the redeveloped Josefov or the area of the dynamic interwar commercial city around Wenceslas Square. The designation of the reserve was an extraordinary cultural act that ended a century long struggle over the historical or modern character of the city center. The mere fact that the entire history city center has been protected for half a century is extremely interesting and in the context of its urban history undoubtedly remarkable. Just for comparison, 50 years of conservation area of uh, heritage reserve 
roughly corresponds to the 50-year period from the enactment of the Redevelopment Act, which brought about the demolition of more than 600 houses in Yosefov and the Old Town in 1893, to the declaration of the wartime building closure in 1941, the period when the city centre changed the most in its modern history. A similar period of time also links the formulation of radical avant-garde architectural and urban planning principles in the early 1920s and their widespread element implementation in the 1960s. It is remarkable and from a heritage point of view crucial that it was during this period that the idea of the area protection of the centre was intensively discussed and finally pushed through at the end of 19. 60s. Of the 50 years of its existence, 20 years are attributable to the communist period and 30 to the period of the new renewed democracy. This comparison alone is interesting and disturbing at the same time. Those who follow the tense debates about interventions in the historical environment of the heritage reserve cannot fail to notice that even three decades since the regime changed, it has not been possible to define firm urban rules for its development or to clarify the roles and responsibilities of the actors involved. Thus, to comparison, probably this comparison probably implies the unhappy fact that many contradictory trends that seemed temporary after 1990, such as low quality commercial development or the continuous depopulation of the center, must be considered as constant and counted on for the future. In the context of this evaluation, we can reflect on the role of the centre in the context of the city as a whole. In many respects, this remains the same. The historic centre is still the symbolic and significant centre of the metropolis, and its privileged urban position remains unchallenged. However, this fact contrasts quite sharply with the decline of real urban life that has been evident here for decades, and which the restrictions associated with anti-poverty measures have mercilessly exposed. Walking through the emptied city, devoid of visitors and permanent residents was probably one of the most powerful and chilling things to experience in the past year from a heritage perspective. It would be possible to take stock of the new buildings that have entered the historic environment and probably conclude that, especially in the last two decades, these interventions have been commercially extensive rather than architecturally high quality. To reflect on the reconstruction of individual monuments, the quality of which has been continuous across the decades, and apart from partial commercial excesses, very good. To analyze the system of monument protection, which has been changing since the early 1990s, to analyze the quality of the monuments. In the early 1990s, it gradually loosened until it reached a state of open schizophrenia. Or we could very well reflect on the current regulation and the concept of development of the reserve. The former de facto does not exist and the latter is rather disturbing in the context of the forthcoming metropolitan plan. However, today I would like to try to take a historical view which attempts to see the heritage reserve in the context of the circumstances and principles in which its idea was born and subsequently promoted. A similar return to history may sound like an attempt to escape from the aforementioned current issues that trouble the contemporary reserve nowadays. However, I hope to show that the opposite may be true and understanding the roots of reserve's origin may be one way to understand its current problems. In 1919, the architect and urban planner Max Urban exhibited his vision of an ideal greater Prague at the Lucerna Palace. His work was impressive. The city, which has shortly before become the metropolis of the new Czechoslovak state, was presented here as a continuous metropolitan structure based on a system of boulevard, circular compositions and monumental urban access. The generous vision transformed almost everything in the organism of city. New streets and squares were placed without regard to the existing built-up area so that the plan actually depicted a completely different city from the one Prague actually was at the time. There was one area, however, before which Urban's radicalism stopped. It was the historic center to the extent of the old town or lesser town in Herchani, the protection of which 
the author explained in the accompanying text as follows. Nowhere else in the injunction of tactful investigation of the old town, perhaps so justified as in Prague. Let it be a guideline for this plan that the preservation of the lesser town and Herchani within the limits of today, the preservation of still preserved parts of the old town is a command for this plan. These are reserves which my hand would not touch. The plan by Urban was groundbreaking, both in the area of the protection of the city centre and also as it concerns the concept of reserve, which was perhaps for the first time identified urbanistically with the still vibrant commercial centre of the city. Nevertheless, Urban's approach very well reflected the views of Czech modern architects who, after 1900, rejected the mechanical remediation approach to the historic center and were diligently seeking ways to reconcile contemporary modern architecture with the equally modern phenomenon of heritage preservation. This search, of which the club wrote Prague, founded in 1900, was in an important center even back then, resulted not only in criticism of the unnecessary demolition of entire parts of the city, but also in a new architectural synthetic concept. One of the results of this remarkable endeavor are, for example, the projects of the outstanding architect Josef Kuchar, which show both the potential power of the, of the symbiosis of new architecture with a given place, the Cubist House of the Black Madonna from 1911 and 12, and the limits of the temptation to point out and finish the historical environment, which has competition for project for competition of the old town hall from 1999, as you can see at the slide. Max Urban, Max Urban ideal Prague was not realized, but some principle clearly persisted. Urban himself became secretary of the State Regulatory Commission, which was to decide on the urban planning fate of Prague as the new capital of the Czechoslovak Republic. A heritage reserve was not declared in the center, but the regulation plan submitted by the Regulation Commission in 1929 partly respected its idea. The most valuable districts, like Herčany, Lesser Town of Prague and Old Town, were to be spared from future major traffic interventions, which was the first step towards their more comprehensive protection. The problem with the plan, however, was that the Commission did not use this wide decision either to consistently protect the centre, as the preservationist wished, or to bring about its more significant modern transformation, which was the dream of the emerging young, unsentimental generation. So, as I said, the Commission did not use this decision to preserve the old centre, nor to bring about some more significant modern transformation, which was the dream of the emerging young generation. The regulatory plan presented was intended to be consensus culmination of a tumultuous decade and a solid foundation for the future development of the Metropolitan Centre. Its, re its reception, nevertheless, was rather ambivalent. In an honest attempt to compromise between the historic city and the demands of the new era, the plan seemed to have satisfied almost no one. A young architect, J.K. Jiha, in 1929, has written, in the middle of the Vltava Basin lies a beautiful city. But unfortunately, this beautiful city lies in the middle of the entire Prague, in a commercial center in the most exposed location and is from today's point of view completely impractical. This fact cannot be denied even by the greatest defenders of old Prague. Once they have objectively observed how life today is reflected in the old streets, crowds of pedestrians, cars, trams and buses, dangerous intersections, the last rhythm of life chanted by commercial adv advertisements, vast buildings with offices of public and industrial administration. All this life of today invades the old streets, the very center of the city, the traditional node where the links of the peripheries intersect. Pressed in from all sides, it invades there in a marvelous disorder crashes against the street fronts and day after day, for many years, has been unraveling corners and demolishing old buildings and all the ephemeral principles by which the defenders of old Prague and the authorities are always trying to readapt the old street to new requirements. Everything that makes up Prague 
what it is, is thus by development and circumstance placed in a small basin in joyless cows on a few hectares of land. Its past and its future are mainly mixed and crushed together in this small area by the overwhelming pressure of today's intensity of life. Every one of us who already knows and loves both of these permutations of Prague by instinct alone understands well the horror, the horror with which two different cities permeate each other mixed here into a single city. For these cities are as different as two races by the crossing of which only cripples can be born. Jiha's word were very, end of quote, Jiha's word were very precise. The center of Prague was the real center of the city and it was here that its greatest building activity was concentrated. This is illustrated by a plan drawn up in 1928 by the aforementioned author of the ideal great Prague, Max Urban. I quote, the earlier prophecies of building miracles in the new capital and the later, the later skepticism about the cursed building vessel were both half right. The balance of the 10 years show about a middle ground between the two. The author concludes, the densification of the city occurred in the parts of greatest frequency, that is, of greatest land value. That is primarily the central part of the new town and the parts of old town adjacent to the main thoroughfare. According to Urban, in the new town between Venceslas Square, Pshiko Pihibenska and the Orchard, there were 258 houses from where there were 258 houses, there were 88 new buildings, which represents one third of the town. The combination of the building movement at the end of the 1920s can be clearly seen in the fact that 1928 accounts for almost 50% of this. The ideological background of Mirstein's project from 1926 was clearly explained by Karl Teige, the most influential theoretician of the Czech avant-garde at the time. The bustling life of the city causes communication congestion in the streets and at the same time arouses the need for the concentration and extreme economy of place. Place is money, must be the motto of the building plan, Teige declares. Taige proposes to build, uh, Taige says that Milstein proposes to build tall buildings in the middle of the existing closed blocks of flats so that these skyscrapers are not visible from the street. Such sky skyscrapers, however, according to him, bring all disadvantages and no advantage since it is not an advantage to conform to the prevailing opinion about the aesthetic of the city and the genius Rotsi, which does not want to allow skyscrapers in Prague at any price for reasons of visual and supposedly aesthetic reasons. According to Tiger, Milstein's attempt at compromise is equally futile. I quote, Tiger said, preservationists will find that Milstein's sky skyscrapers, if they do not disturb the view from close-up, disturb the panoramic view from Petschin, Zizhkov, Briga's Gardens, Herachene and Letna, just as the powder tower would probably disturb the city if it were to be built today. Taige, however, wants to go much further. Again, I quote, the good, beautiful architecture of skyscrapers will prove to be of aesthetic value when viewed up close, as well as when viewed as in, in panoramic and aerial views. So we will not mask its beauty with buildings, but surround it with greenery in which it will stand out better. We believe that the avenue of sky skyscrapers on Wenceslas Square and Psychope would look very beautiful and imposing in a panoramic view, with the highest skyscraper on the site of today's custom house as an impressive landmark. So this is the design from 1926. In this criticism, J.K. Jiha saw the interventions of the regulatory plan as insufficient and destructive for both old and new Prague. In this respect, he was followed six years later by architects from the Association of Engineers and Architects, SIA, with their project for the radical redevelopment of the city centre. The debate this project provoked gives us, with a hindsight, a great insight into the architectural and monumental thinking of the time. 
for the authors of the SIA plan, the old town was just a disparate conglom conglomerate and a veritable mosaic of spatial impressions in which they found not only parts of monumental value, but also parts of old but not valuable in terms of monuments, and to a large extent unhealthy or inferior which will certainly be rebuilt in a shorter or longer period of time. And finally, they also saw parts of the new redevelopment, the former Jewish town, which from their point of view is already unhealthy in many of its parts. In view of the necessity to rehabilitate not only the new, but also the old part of heritage value, the SIA architect group declares the area of the old town with the Jewish as a whole a redevelopment area. I will show you an example. Here you can see an example of redevelopment of the block adjacent to the church of St. Jacob. So the first step is the place, evaluation of the place. In the second step, you can already see a new structure. And on the third picture, you can see the new development, the new construction with the street still having its original pl emplacement and structure and here very very slowly and progressively the new redevelopment is already performed and executed and this is the moment when Zdenikvit, Studem Zdenikvit, who has who ha was already mentioned several times during this conference he was one of the greatest figures in the preservation of monuments in the first half of the 20th century and he spoke on behalf of the preservationists his defense of the historic city consisted in not accepting the protection of selected parts of the city viewing the city as a great plastic complex which i quote cannot we cannot judge especially its plan and its mass the city like all architecture has its plan its scales and proportions its important situation of landmarks etc all periods are mirrored in the city, in its plan, its construction, its facades, its roofs, its landmarks, and not one of them is superior to another in terms of, its, of their value. It is therefore necessary to consider how to preserve this great architectural unity and how to allow contemporary life to develop in it. This thesis was fundamental for the future view of the city. Contemporary life has its place in the historic city, but it must respect its artistic unity. The fulfillment of this ideal, however, must have seemed almost utopian at the time. In the late 1930s, the Czech architectural and heritage community was polarized, and the city may once again have been on the threshold of radical reconstruction as the real and visionary project of high-rise building in the city center show. This project is very well renowned. Here you can see the design of the hospital that you can see to the right side of this Havlicek's design from between the walls. However, everything was thwarted by the sudden end of Czechoslovakia, the declaration of the protectorate and the Second World War, the direct consequence of which for the city was the aforementioned building closure in 1941. In terms of urban planning, the protectorate period brought both megalomaniac visions and a change in the relationship to the historic center, which was threatened by devastating air raids and whose demise was suddenly much closer than it might have seemed until then. The sense of threat accentuated by the air raids in February 1945 and the fighting in May, which resulted, among other things, in the burning of the Old Town Hall, obviously profoundly changed the relationship of the inhabitants to the historic city. Prague was much less damaged than other Central European cities. Nevertheless, even the few buildings that were destroyed were enough to make the protection of monumental Prague a widely shared social narrative that even the most radical creators had to take into account in their plans, whether they wanted to or not. Post-war views of the development of the city were summarized in the Prague Master Plan, which was completed and, submi and submitted in the tragic year of 1948, when the Communist Party came to power in Czechoslovakia by force.
In spite of the emerging Stalinist regime, which also had major consequences for urban planning and architecture, the plan was completed in a purely functionalist conception, viewing the city as a set of separate functional zones connected by transport routes, as you can see the design to the right. That is one of the that is one of the pictures from the plan itself. One of these zones included the historic center of the city, which paradoxically can be protected much more rigorously than in the pre-war regulatory concept. The communist takeover had, among many other consequences, one direct and concrete effect on the city center. The liquidation of private property meant that a hitherto constant and intense pressure to rebuild or demolish individual buildings in the city center suddenly came to a sudden and forced halt. The mortification of normal architectural life followed seamlessly on the aforementioned wartime building closure. If we add to this the fact that the investment attention of the new regime was concentrated on industrial and mining areas, we can conclude that the city fell into an urban slumber for two decades, from which it was not awakened even by the grand communist visions, which in the imagination of their authors were to once again radically and symbolically transform the city centre. It is an extraordinary historical paradox that it was during the period of the harshest Stalinist terror that the first monuments reserve, the first heritage reserves, were declared in Czechoslovakia. The fact that the old town and the lesser town with Hrachany were included in this list may have contributed to the fact that these absurd ideas about cutting through the old town or building a high-rise landmark as a counterpoint to the castle were, um, were fortunately not realized. After the Stalinist pressure subsided, architecture began to return to the ideals it had developed in the interwar and post-war period. The directional plan, drawn up in 1961, again subscribed to modernist principles, which included a separate heritage zone, including traditionally Hradčany, Malá Strana and the Old Town. The center of Prague, a substantial part of which is the historic core, Hradčany, Malá Strana and the Old Town, is a space of sharp conflict, stated Jiří Novotný, the author of the directional plan in 1961. And I continue the quote. On the one hand, it is an open city for all important social events, business spirit, social life, entertainment and refreshment, but on the other hand, it is a closed city of valuable historical, cultural and architectural monuments in an untouchable conservation area or heritage reserve. On the one hand, an open city of national and political economic life and public administration. On the other hand, a closed city full of narrow streets and traffic passes in the historic communication network. On the one hand, an open city is by far the largest concentrated workplace of the whole Prague. On the other, a closed city of heavy, unsanitary water blocks and spaces of capitalist construction. End of quote. Jiří Novotný. Jiří Novotný, as Prague's chief urban planner, thus found himself facing a similar problem to the one described three decades ago by J.K. Zíha in his aforementioned criticism of the State Regulatory Commission's plan. The situation was different, but the symptoms were the same. The requirement to be both the center of the metropolis and the state was in stark contrast to the urban reality of the historic city, which in 1929, as in 1961, was the real epicenter of the commercial activity of the entire conglomeration. The political and economic systems were markedly different, but the intensity with which the center was used was not so different. While the private activity and bustle of the commercial avenues was replaced by the traffic associated with the supply and operation of the hundreds of businesses that had their headquarters, operations or warehouses, there the pressure on street traffic was ultimately the same, if not greater. 
However, something has changed. The criticism of narrow streets and traffic gaps, which had been recurring for generations at moments of economic recovery in the city, was not in principle to lead this time to large-scale demolition of historic blocks or to mechanical widening of the streets of the old town and the lesser town. The consciousness of the value of the untouchable reserve, which is a term used by Novomi, survived the ideological turbulence of the 1950s and became somewhat paradoxically, in fact, part of the modernist urban narrative of the 1960s. The aim of the author of the master plan was not to meet the utilitarian requirements of the time, but to find a balance in which the historic center could preserve its essence and at the same time fulfill the required citywide roles. According to the authors of the plan, the quarter that was to provide them was Nové Město, the new town. His ideas of what was possible in the early 1960s were indeed generous, although the vast district had an original Gothic layout from the 14th century. Its buildings were mostly from the 19th and 20th centuries, which in the eyes of the urban planners and architects of the 1960s meant there was no problem to rebuild the district completely. The epicenter of the city was to be located in the Yindrishka quarter, a part of the interwar commercial city, which in the opinion of the time had lost its meaning with the demise of capitalism and could thus be demolished. According to Novotny, it is there that a new modern social, commercial, administrative, cultural and entertainment center corresponding to the size and importance of Prague can be built by gradually reconstructing this entire area, which will also be adjacent to the main railway station as the main transport hub and the north-south motorway, which was the first of the intended structure of motorways that were to crisscross the entire city in the imagination of urban planners. The future of the historic city center was therefore clear in the early 1960s. The left bank and the old town were destined for heritage regeneration. The new town, as well as other districts of the wider center for significant rede redevelopment to meet the needs of the times. At the same time, however, an action is culminating that is to transform the view of the historic city and its value once again. Since the beginning of the 1950s, thanks to the enthusiasm and extraordinary commitment of the art historian Dobroslav Liebel and his colleagues from the Surpmo, which was already mentioned, this was an institution established in the 1950s for the restoration and survey of monuments, blocks of downtown districts were systematically explored, not only in the protected lesser town or old town, but also in the development area of the new town. Already the results of the first wave of surveys were fascinating. The numerous finds of Romanesque houses, the number of which increased by a third, thanks to the surveys, helped to refine the idea of the earliest history of the city and the extent of construction in this earliest period. Equally important were the findings concerning the key Gothic urban layer. You can beautifully see the Roman, Romanesque and the Gothic part, it's the Bethlehem Chapel. The survey showed that the degree of preservation of Gothic Prague is much greater than anyone had imagined until then. Dobroslav Liebal and Eduard Stach commented that the number and variety of Gothic houses was surprising. Now I, I quote. Several two-story Gothic houses with original gables and roofs still stand in the old town of Prague, end of quote. For the first time, the thesis of potential meaning of classicist uh, buildings was formulated. Liebel's team had an amazing textual presentation. This is the best way you can present it. It's a visualization of the city's history and 
This became a natural protective factor against any attempts at vigorous demolition in the historic center. The preparation of detailed surveys was thus the last and most important step on the road to consistent protection of the historic center, which culminated in 1971 with the declaration of the Prague Heritage Reserve. The comprehensive understanding of all the historical layers of the historic center naturally opened up the complex question of its possible further architectural development. Two points of view clash in the urban planning area, says Viktor Kotrba and Dobroslav Liebal in 1969. The first one applies the basic principle of conservation and does not allow further urban and architectural development. The second, on the other hand, proclaims that the historic city must continue to evolve artistically. In their view, conservation was created precisely out of the need and necessity to protect and stabilize the preserved condition, which, as stated, does not allow for further substantial architectural changes in its entirety, the authors state. Defining a periodically significant thesis about the completed development of monuments. Looking at the architectural interventions of the 1960s, however, it is clear that this thesis will certainly not apply to the city as a whole. Contemporary architecture has asserted itself in the center quite confidently, but the result is often a remarkable dialogue with the historic environment, as illustrated by some examples here, Kotva, Intercontinental Hotel, or the cubes which were not received favorably by everyone. Building. So, the most interesting example in this respect was the ambitious extension of the facade of the Emmaus Church, realized according to the winning competition project by F.M. Czerny. The victory of his project was seen even in conservation circles as a certain turn of events which gave hope for the connection of contemporary design with the historical environment. This architectural competition has a double meaning, wrote Aleš Vushahlík and Oldřich Dostal in 1965 in response to Czerny's clear victory. First of all, and this is undoubtedly its primary factual contribution, it finally resolves at a high artistic level the long open question of the actual restoration of the Western facade. And secondly, it has a profound ideological impact in the development of contemporary opinion and approach to the restoration of monuments. It characterizes the contemporary movement of opinion and contributes to a favorable improvement in the conception of such architectural tasks where a symbiosis between contemporary and historical work is to be contributed. It excludes the intermediate element of a specific reconstruction or preservationist architecture and induces a healthy relationship between the full-blooded architecture of the past and the presence. present. The result of the competition is incidentally the first official document in the development of our heritage protection, where the possibility of reconstructing a destroyed part of an important historical monument with a modern architectural expression is codified. It is crucial for the topic that we are looking at that it is in this atmosphere that the final proposal for the declaration of the Prague Conservation Area required by the 1958 Monuments Act is born. The proposal, which at first included only the existing reserves in the extent of Hradčany, the lesser town and the old town, was extended to include the new town, which was perceived as an exceptional example of, of medieval urbanism. And I think I'm running out of time. Do I have the last five minutes? Yes. Five minutes, not more. That's what I thought. So let me sum it up. Josef Mayer and Aleš Vošahlík commented on the creation of the reserve. You can see the text on the protection of the Prague Heritage Reserve. They created a justification report on the reserve and they divided it into localities, to zones, 
and they assess them from the architecture point of view. For them, not only the historical parts were important, but also the ones built in the 19th and 20th centuries. If we can judge from the above mentioned contemporary responses, the declaration of the reserve was a relatively consensual act. It was also clear from the statements of the preservationists that they did not see the recognition of the historical value of the center as excluding the possibility of contemporary architecture entering some parts of the center, which was evidenced by the successful creative achievements mentioned above. With the declaration of the Heritage Reserve in Prague, all the work has only just begun, say Jaroslav Mayer and Avashivo Šahlík optimistically in 1972. The problem also was that the birth of the reserve coincided with the onset of normalization, which meant that the phenomenon of heritage protection or the heritage reserve entered the scene at a time when social life as such was in a state of stagnation. With the deepening of normalization, the discussions in the professional press, which were one of the important disciplinary prerequisites for the creation of the Monument Reserve, gradually ceased. For official architecture, creative dialogue ceased to be a central theme, and it quickly lost the sensitivity that had been the key to the consensus of the late 1960s. The insensitive urban planning and architectural interventions carried out in many Czech historic towns in the 1970s and 1980s not only reinforced the view of many preservationists that the development of historic towns was essentially finished, but also sometimes led to the belief that modern architecture was in a priori opposition to monuments. The stereotypes this created profoundly influenced not only the normalization 20 years, but also the fate of the heritage reserve after 1989. The creation of the reserve has created a situation in which the responsibility for its future has largely been taken over by the conservation authorities. Its influence, although not always realistic, was perceived as decisive in the eyes of the other actors. In addition, thanks to the subsequent unfortunate weakening of the role of the chief architect in the 1990s, the monument's opinion often became the only obstacle to new projects. In the 1980s, the credit of the preservationists rose with every absurd plan of the state power, which increasingly ruthlessly destroyed the landscape and monuments. Symbolic moments, including the barbaric blasting of the Tishnovsky railway station in Prague in 1985, strengthened the general awareness of heritage. The post-revolutionary situation brought about the fair return of private ownership, which again placed the monument care in a completely new situation for which it was not and could not have been prepared. Nevertheless, the actors coped with it with honor and Thanks to the initiative of new or old owners, it was possible to stop the widespread decay of the entire reserve at the 12th at the last minute. This situation also meant the rapid return of private building initiative, which the city center had last seen in this intensity in the 1930s. Its limits, however, were newly defined by monument protection. This situation once again reinforced the aforementioned defensive action of the preservationists, which, under the pressure of circumstances, had to move significantly away from the optimistic ideas of the late 1960s and early 1970s. Another fundamental problem for the existence of the reserve was the abandonment of the modernist principle of the zone city, and I'd like to 
emphasize this. The inevitable movement of urban contemporary currents has meant that since the 1990s, the city has once again been seen as a compact metropolis. This fact is illustrated not only by the many projects, but also by the current draft of the Metropolitan Plan, which is supposed to set the rules for the development of the city for the next decade, and which unfortunately reinforces this situation by its unfortunate emphasis on the monocentricity of the city. The situation inevitably leads to conflicts that the city has already known in the 20th century. It is clear that without a consistent definition of the role of the reserve and the purpose of its protection, its future preservation is unthinkable. The international significance of the Prague Heritage Reserve was confirmed in 1992 by its inscription on the UNESCO World Heritage List. 30 years after this symbolic act, its situation is unfortunately not ideal. If at the time of its designation, there was a consensus among architectural and heritage circles on its importance and protection reflected in the strategy of institutions and municipal decrees, Nowadays, expert circles and responsible institutions are in hidden or open conflict, as evidenced by disputes or the aforementioned metropolitan plan. On the other hand, it is relatively safe to say that the monument protection has the apparent support of the public, which has clearly accepted the value and protection of the historic center of Prague as it, on its own. This is probably its greatest strength and hope. The bold project of the Prague Heritage Reserve has clearly succeeded in this respect, as its meaning in the eyes of the public has overcome the radical change of regime, forms of ownership, and other contradictory conditions. Needless to say, what a shame this would be. It is clear that the personally experienced controversies and conflicts of the first 60 years of the 20th century have also long afforded it the protection by gradually acquired precedents and consensus. Situations and generation, generations change, and not much remains of the original pillars that shaped and held the reserve. If it is to survive in a realistic way, we need to open up a broad interdisciplinary debate as soon as possible about its meaning, mission, protection, and development, for only then will we be able to celebrate its well-deserved centenary in 50 years' time. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for having surpassing my time. Well, yes, it was only a few seconds. So thank you very much for your analytical insight there are two or more questions but unfortunately we only have time for the first two of them so the first question reminds us that this lecture is a part of your habilitation will this habilitation be published just a few words yes yes by the end of the year there should be the publication of this great to hear that thank you and there is another question from professor schwacher i will just read it your lecture has shown us very well the continuity of problems and topics regarding the protection of historical center of prague from the 1920s up to nowadays i would like to know what caused the discontinuity of it in your opinion thank you well it's a good question i think that paradoxically the continuity the discontinuity appeared at the same time as the heritage reserve reserve was declared the discussion leading to the declaration of the Heritage Reserve was very long. It uh, was going on and on from 1920s to 
because the participants of this debate were active from the beginning of the century until the, 19, until the 1950s. But then the discussion about the meaning of the reserve and what it should look like are rooted differently. They have different origins. Also, this debate was it was also new generations who took part in this new debate as it should be but unfortunately their views were not reflected well enough another point of discontinuity is the normal so-called normalization in the 1970s so that much for the, the most important discontinuity. Of course, there are some partial conflicts and misunderstandings, but uh, they are minor. They are minor compared to this. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. And I've got another task, given that this was the last lecture of the whole conference, not only of today's part of it. So my task is to send our thanks to our audience who has been listening to us and watching us on YouTube channels. I would also, also like to thank all the speakers and I hope that all the papers will be published also in their written form. At the same time, I would like to thank to the interpreters, because their work is very tough given the complex character of the lectures. And I was, would also like to thank the organizers, Mrs. Matsourkova and Mr. Vanya, who assured the technical and organizational side of the conference. So thank to you too. And as to say, Spiritus against at Movens, I would also like to thank Dr. Uhlikova and the whole organizational committee of this conference because they deserve our thanks as well. To conclude, let's remind all the institutions that, thanks to which uh, this conference was possible. So this conference was held by the Institute of Art History of the Czech Academy of Sciences, the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes, the National Heritage Institute, and the Institute of Contemporary History of the Czech Academy of Sciences. The Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic has supported this conference in the framework of strategy AVE as well and last but not last but not least i would also like to thank the the internet magazine propamatki so once again a large thank you to all of these institutions and it is my wish that the synergy of these institutions continue even in the future so once again thank thanks to you all and goodbye